So welcome everyone. Um, this is a talk about economics. My name is Jeremy Smith and I'm the Director of Undergraduate Studies uh, within the department. I'm going to be talking for about 25 minutes and then I'm going to pass over to my colleague Hatisha who's going to be talking about careers and then we've got a mini mini taster lecture given by one of our colleagues Timo Fetzer who's going to tell you a bit about economics. I'm going to kind of do the more dry stuff, which is essentially about the program and what, what the department does. So that, that's the layout, and we've got to be in and out in an hour, because last week uh, we got told off badly. So we've been told to stick strictly to deadlines, because then we throw out the whole of the week. So I probably shouldn't um, go on too much. Right. So uh, as a department, they're what our kind of guiding principles are. So basically, it's to deliver an outside, and sorry, an outstanding teaching and learning experience. Then on the research side, it's basically innovative research that's policy relevant, to build a diverse and inclusive community within the department. And our guiding principle is create an environment based on respect and integrity. So we're a very international department. The student makeup in any year is about 50-50 between home students, that means UK students, and the rest of the world, uh, which is kind of the rest of Europe and further afield. And the academic community is even more broad than that. Within the department, about 18 to 20% is UK-based, and then about 80% is international. And when I mean international, I mean truly international. So it's from Europe, it's from South America, it's from Asia, it's from Australia, it's from the States, from South America. We cover almost everything. And that gives you a great experience because we've got colleagues who can talk about not just a very localized economic situation, but they can bring in examples from their home country. So it enables you to get a worldwide perspective on economics. So economics in terms of some numbers. Uh, so Times and Sunday Guide from 2023 was first. Complete University Guide was fourth. Um, the, research, uh, the recent Research Excellence Framework, which evaluates research within the, uh, across the country, put Warwick second. And internationally, so that is across all economics, basically departments and institutes, Warwick was 22nd. So, as one of the guiding principles we have within the department is we want to treat all of our students as kind of potential researchers. And so, throughout the degree program, we get them to experience and undertake some of their own research. And that starts in the first year within the statistics modules where you're introduced to computer programming, state or R, and one of the assignments is basically to produce a research paper telling myself or one of my colleagues something that we didn't know before using some data. We then build on that in the second year in your econometrics modules to build on that idea of developing research. And then there's capstone modules in the third year, which is basically research in applied economics, where it's an independent piece of research, or it might be research methods module, or it might be research in policy evaluation. And in talking about policy evaluation, I think that's what Timo's going to talk to you about. And so you get a mini, mini tasty lecture of what the third year might look like. And that builds more broadly, not only within the department, more widely. So there's a Warwick internship scheme for economists, and that enables us to give you some research experience, either working with a colleague on their project. It might be administrative research. It might be research supporting colleagues in developing some of their resources for their modules. There's also a university URSS scheme. There's undergraduate conf uh, conferences. So this picture is from, I think it's from 2022. This guy's Marco. He was a third year student. Jenny, a third year student. Sophie, I think it was, third-year student. This was not a third-year student. This is uh, Joshua Angrist, who's uh, a Nobel Prize winner. But they went off to Georgetown and presented their research coming out of research in applied economics. And in general, we send a lot of our students abroad to um, do these kind of conferences, and it's an opportunity for them to 
demonstrate the kind of skills that they've acquired during their time in the department. So what else is there? Basically, within the department, we run two degree programs. There's an economics degree program, and then there's an economics and politics degree program. There's a, then, additionally, a range of other modules which economics or degree courses which economics contributes to, economics, psychology, and philosophy, economics and global sustainable development, economics and languages or language and economics, maths and economics, economics and liberal arts, PPE, and MORSE, of which the E stands for the economics. They're not controlled within the department, but they're uh, degree courses to which economics contributes. So I'm mainly going to talk about the two on the left-hand side rather than the ones on the right-hand side. So if you're thinking about economics, what we try and do is we front-load it with all of the kind of basics of the skills that you need as an economist. So we're going to teach you macroeconomics, we're going to teach you microeconomics, we're going to teach you maths and statistics, and then that continues in your second year. And then in the third year, you've got all of the base skills that you need in order to explore different areas of economics. So you can see in the first year, there's lots of core things, things you're obliged to take. Macro one, micro one, quantitative techniques. Each of those are year-long modules as is the economic history year-long module. So you've got up to two options. Not much, but that's it. Two options in the first year. Second year, more micro, more macro, more statistics, three cores, and up to two options. Okay? But you've got all of the materials you then need in terms of the skills of how to do optimization, understanding the macroeconomy or your statistics to tackle any third year module. So in the third year, you're going to take essentially research in applied economics, the thing I was talking about earlier, or you're going to take research methods, how to do a literature review and assess what other people have done, or you take research in policy evaluation, that is understanding how you can evaluate policies that have been implemented. One of those is a kind of core module, and then you've got up to six optional modules. And see, therefore, you can get more flexibility as you go through the degree program. And it's been designed in that way. OK. And so on ePACE, the economics and politics one, because you're doing a bit of economics and a bit of politics, it's a bit trickier. There's economics one, half micro, half macro. There's quantitative techniques again, bit of maths, bit of statistics. And then there's world politics, and then an introduction to politics, and then up to two optional modules. So again, lots of cores, little flexibility in the first year. Second year, it depends how you specialize. Everyone's got to do economics too, bit of macro, bit of micro. But then you've got a choice, because you might either specialize in economics, or you specialize in politics, or you'd become generally bipartite and do bits of both. And then the third year, again, gets more flexible, in which there's only one core module, which is the making of economic policy, and then up to six options. What are the options we offer? Well, that is a small sample of what we offer across different years. So we've got behavioral economics, so understanding a bit of psychology and how that impacts on people's uh, behavior. We've got collective decisions, which is essentially how people vote in order to make a decision. Economics of money and banking, hopefully that's obvious. Environmental economics, pretty obvious what that is as well. Financial economics, how the finance system works. International economics, about trade. Mathematical economics, essentially for those who are more mathematically inclined, which is often game theory. And then there's other ones going down there. But your options don't have to be just within economics. We're flexibly enough to allow you to take options outside the department or inside the department. And there are some of the more popular modules on the right-hand side that students have taken during one of their years outside the department. And you can take modules in each of your years outside the department. So as I've said, what do we do in kind of teaching and learning? Uh, many say this, but ours is generally research-led teaching. So you've got people who are telling you about their research and how that informs their teaching. 
So that's one of the key principles. Lots of face-to-face -face teaching, either in big lectures, not quite as big as this, but over in the Oculus, so it could be three, four, five hundred people in a lecture, and then kind of small group classes, which is between 15 and 20 people, which is basically discussing the exercise sheets or the problem sets that the lecturers set in order for you to understand more deeply the stuff that's been talked about in those lectures. We have an online platform to support teaching and learning. It's called Moodle, but it's a kind of virtual learning environment which will have kind of the lectures that have been covered are on there, along with the lecture material and other support mechanisms. So within your degree course, in the first year, it's more, more or less three hours per module. So you're looking at about 15 face-to-face -face hours per week, slightly less in the second year, slightly less in the third year, as you become more of an independent learner and it's less kind of directed instruction. Okay, so how do we assess students? Well, we assess them in a variety of ways. There's material coursework during the year, and that could be made up of essays. It might be class tests. It might be presentation. It might be research project. And typically, that might be about 20% of the value of the module. The other 80% would often then be a final year exam. But it varies by module. So there's some modules that are entirely 100% assessed during the year, and there are some modules which is basically assessed entirely by an exam. So that's kind of an average of what happens across a variety of modules, and you can specialise depending upon whether your relative skills are in terms of more end-of-year exams or more assessment during the year. So beyond study, we're going to talk, there's a variety of things we do. So when you come in, uh, teaching starts in week one, and there's a week naught, which is what they call academic induction, which is just to welcome you to the university and get settled in. There's nothing formal there. It's just about orientating yourself around the campus and understanding what a department does and what the university does. But within the first year, we also have something called a personal development module. And this personal development module is to try and give you skills outside of your academic skills. How to build a CV, how to think about employability. And I know at 18, you don't want to come in and think, what's the first thing I want to know about, which is what job I'm getting. But it's important when you're here, you think about a rounded education. You think about your academics and you think about your non-academic things. And personal development module is to try and help you on that transition to get a balanced level of activity across all the things that you need to do in order to potentially get jobs at the end of your final year. We've got a student ambassador scheme whereby um, second and third year students support the department. There's a mentor scheme where those second and third year students support first year students in transitioning to university because that's one of the trickiest things to do to get that balance right on the basis that you've no longer got a parent standing next to you saying have you done your homework tonight essentially it's just given to you and it's expected to do that yourself and plan your work life balance so the mentors are there to guide you and advise you on the best way of tackling all of that and there's other activities social events study abroad Warwick Economic Lectures, where we bring people in and talk about the discipline more broadly. As I said, it's important when you're into university, you take full advantage of the opportunities there. And that's not just the academics, that's also clubs and societies. And I think the university has something like 300 clubs and societies, although my data is from about two years ago. Uh, and it's important that you engage with those because they're often the things that employers are most interested about. Your ability to tell a story about when you tried something and it failed and what you learned from it. And you don't necessarily get that by just sitting in a lecture or in a class. The ones most students engage with and the ones specifically rele relevant to economics Warwick Women in Economics, Warwick Economic Summit, which is a fantastic summit, happens in term two, get speakers from around the world, invariably get two or three Nobel Prize winners every year. 
uh, the Warwick Economic Society, Rethink Economics, Finance Society and Politics Society. But think about when you're here, taking advantage of all of that. There's also a study abroad. Every year at Open Days, everyone says, study abroad, study abroad. And it's a great opportunity. But in general, it's undertaken by about 5 to 10% of our cohort. OK. Um, you've got to, it's an honor to go on that. So there's a kind of academic hurdle to go on that. that. It's about engagement. It's about the relationship with your personal tutor. It's about your academic performance beforehand. Uh, the range of institutions where study abroad is are listed there, mainly in Europe. Uh, there's also Monash in Australia, and I think we're branching out a bit. I thought there was somewhere else. But it's mainly, mainly in uh, Europe and then, the, and then this uh, Monash, because we've got a Memorandum of Understanding, an MOU, with Monash about moving students there and then sending students back to Warwick. It's important when you're here that you feel supported. Again, that transition away from being home to abandoning your kind of support network, either within your family or your friends, means that stuff can happen. And we're very aware of that. And as a result, we have lots of support. So we've got an undergraduate office with about 10 people in at the moment, which is, you know, who are experts on the running of the degree program very friendly, and if you ever have problems, that's open essentially 8 a.m. till about 5 p.m. every day. Just go drop in. We've also got a student well-being and progression officers. Again, there to support you on issues that might occur, arise during the year to support you and make sure that your well-being is at the forefront of everything you do. We've got a personal tutor system. We've also got year tutors who, again, sit above the personal tutors and understand how to engage more with university processes if things arise. And there's various other forms of advisors, depending upon areas of speciality. But again, the range of that indicates that there's someone to support everyone within the department. Some examples of support are listed there. I'm not going to go through them all. You can read them yourselves. But essentially, what we've done in the last few years is think about, and it was often inspired by kind of COVID and the impact of people not necessarily having the full level of training coming into Warwick as we would normally expect. So based on that, we've developed some maths refresher resources, which has now been put onto the Economics Network, a global website to support students thinking of transitioning into economics and the math skills that you might need. So it's not about just X and Y that you're used to. It's about how you can put economic terms on that and then tell stories. We're now developing some statistics resources. We're developing transition to economics resources. And we're developing academic writing resources as well, again, to support students in that transition into the department. Diversity, we talked about this before. We said there's a variety of things that we're very keen on. One is to build a diverse culture, and one is to show respect for everyone. And as a result, we've developed a series of activities to try and make sure that everyone in the department is supported and can bring their full selves into the department, whatever that consists of. So admissions and entry requirements. Uh, we typically make around 900 offers to UK students. Uh, we typically make about 1,300 offers to overseas students. And we're basically aiming at about 400 students across those two degree programs that I've talked about. And that'll be about 200 home students and 200 overseas students in an ideal world. What we look at in terms of making those decisions is your full UCAS application form. So that's basically whatever predicted or actual grades you've got at your level of 18, maybe A-levels, international baccalaureate, French baccalaureate, whatever that is, it's that. We look at your past academic performance. So coming from the UK, that would be your GCSEs. We look at your personal statement. Don't underestimate the personal statement. We look at it. We read each and every one of them. And we also look at the school reference. So just because you come with four or three 
A stars doesn't mean you'll get an offer because essentially we have to look at the full profile of every application and every year we will turn down students who are very, very academically strong. We would like to take each and every one of them, but it's just not possible. So for BSc Economics, it's A star, A star, A, and that A star has to be include maths. It doesn't have to be further maths, just maths, okay? A uh, contextual offer here is essentially two grades below that, so it's A star, A, B, or International Baccalaureate, it's 39. Um, for economics and politics, it's about the same, apart from one of them doesn't have to be A-level maths, uh, because there is a parallel system whereby there's degree and sorry, there's maths and statistics resources which don't require A-level maths for joint degree students. So there's some FAQs here. What GCSEs or prior qualifications do I need? So as I said, we look at your prior qualifications. So we're going to count essentially the number of equivalents of A-star or A's at GCSEs. And as it says there, it's got to include the vast majority of those have got to be at the level of seven, eight, or nine. English language and math should be no lower than grade six. And in fact, almost certainly have to be seven. But we also look at the whole profile of all of your qualifications that you've taken at the age of kind of 16 GCSEs or whatever else you've got. So... What do I include in the personal statement? So I've sat in, in over in Oculus for about 10 years, and the question always arises, what should I include in my personal statement? And what you should include in your personal statement is an interest and a passion for learning about economics. So how can you demonstrate that? So some people say, oh, I read the Financial Times. I mean, I can teach anyone to just write that as a sentence. What you've got to be able to do is demonstrate it. So if it's read the Financial Times, what article and what did you learn from it and what did you then go away and do in order to learn more about it? It's not just saying, I read this book or I read The Economist. It's what in that reading did you take out of it and how have you pursued it in order to develop a greater understanding of that area and how then you're going to link that into a motivation of why to come and study economics as a degree. And that might be you're interested in kind of psychology and therefore interested in behavioral economics. That'd be fine, but tell a story about it. So have you read that book? What, I can't remember what it is, Under Pressure. Think fast, talk slow. Timo? It's something like that. I can't remember the title. Atisha? Thinking fast and slow. I knew it had slow thinking and fast in there, just couldn't quite remember the order. So is that a book you've read and what did you get out of it? Okay, so it's motivating why you want to come. Should you talk about extracurricular activities? Maybe, but probably no more than a sentence. And only if it's specifically related to why you might be then doing some economics. Okay, if it's just, oh, I like to play football, Fine, that shows that you're uh, possibly engaged because the university is going to look at two. So the department looks at one thing. Are you going to be interested in economics and are you going to do well in a degree course? The university wants to think about are you going to be a global student? So are you going to contribute to the university? Are you going to be involved in kind of outreach activities and spread the word of how Warwick can contribute to the community? They're the things you're looking for. So sell that to us. That's what you've got to do. Okay. Um... I think I've summarized that one. What about if I take EPQ, does that count? Or TMUA? Essentially, the answer is no. It will give you a sentence potentially in your personal statement if EPQ or TMUA is related to economics. Other than that, no. Okay? So if you've got done an EPQ essay and it's related to economics, by all means, put that in as part of your motivation. You're interested in this and you did an extended essay and what you learned from it. That's fine, but it will not count beyond that. Are further maths or economics preferred subjects? Further maths is not compulsory, but the more maths you have in economics, the easier you'll find the degree course. So further maths is a great... To, uh, a level to have, but it's not compulsory. But um, economics at Warwick is quite mathematical. 
okay? So you're going to have to work hard at your maths. Essentially, maths is going to be involved in almost every lecture in every class in some aspect or other. And we don't make any qualms about that. In fact, that's how we've built our reputation of producing excellent students that all of the employers want to attract into their uh, business. And that's part of our selling thing. Applied maths, where you get an intuitive understanding of how that links to economics. And so the more maths, invariably the better, about um, 30, I think it's probably 35% of students will have further maths. Okay. Do I need economics? No, you don't. However, about 75% of our students come with economics. But we've understood that, and hence what I was talking about earlier, we've now built resources. In fact, I think Atisha has been involved in that, mainly involved with that, transitioning to economics, which is everyone else you're going to feel has done some economics. So you're going to come and feel a bit nervous when a lecturer talks talking about terminology you're not familiar with. So we've now built resources to kind of say, well, in your first couple of weeks, you might want to look at these just so you're familiar, if you've not done economics before, with that terminology. Do I need economics? Well, I'm going back a long time now, but 10 years ago, a head of department, it's probably longer now because it was Mark Harrison, and so it's probably 2007, but time time goes away from me very quickly, um, was interested in this whether A-level economics has a benefit. So what he did is on day one, he was a bit mean, on day one he gave every student a test, multiple choice, okay? And then we noticed that people with A-level maths got, I'm going to make up these numbers now, 80%, and people without A-level maths got 30%. We did a similar test then four weeks later, might have been five weeks later, gave them another test, everyone had to do it, depending upon it, and by within five weeks, the difference was like four percentage points rather than 50 percentage points, which had been the case. So, do you need it? No, it will help that early transition into economics, but it benefits you for about four, maximum five weeks. And possibly now with the teacher's resources, hopefully that's even less. Um, will taking a fourth A-level do me any good? Uh, as far as we're concerned, no, because we look at your best three A-levels. But that's not to say you can't benefit yourself from doing a fourth A-level. But if you're doing it and that's going to lower your performance in the other three, it's going to be a negative overall. But if you want to have that more worldwide experience of learning a variety of other things, great. But to do it in order to get to Warwick, no. It's not going to help you in any way, shape, or form. And in fact, it could potentially be detrimental if it lowers the performance elsewhere. So do it for your benefit, but don't do it for us at Warwick. Do you offer a year in industry? No. Okay. Um, we don't have placement years. We have a number of students, it's about 10 a year, that do what we call a voluntary year out. And they basically organize a year away from the university between their second and third year because they found a placement. Now, it's not officially part of the degree program. You would be supporting that by student opportunities, so our, our careers service, essentially. But it's not an integral part of the degree program. Okay. Um, I'm going to pass over to Atish now. If anyone wanted to look at taster, taster lectures before Timo's, and Timo's will be far better than all of these previous ones, but if you want to scan any of those, we had Amrita a couple of years ago, Andrew Oswald um, and Tice all doing previous taster lectures on what's, what it is to learn about economics. But after Atisha's talked, we're going to go to Timo, and he's going to talk about policy evaluation. 